Uh, I get to attend uh, a lot of carry-in dinners, mostly funeral ministry dinners. We have this ministry here at Lincoln Christian Church that uh, brings in food and does a carry-in dinner when somebody in our church goes through a time of grieving and, and loss and when all their family is in town and, you know, how do I take care of them all? We bring them here. We have that ministry. It's an amazing ministry. I have just loved the people who serve in that. And all of you, you probably have brought in food at different times to help out with those funeral dinners. But those funeral dinners, there's something about a carry-in dinner that I have always just loved. I mean, I'm not trying to be weird here or anything, but I love funeral dinners. Does that sound horrible? And I asked the staff, I said, tell me, tell me some of your favorite carry-in dinner foods. Now, this, this is from the staff. Here's some of the list. Cheesy potatoes, a potato salad, chicken and noodles, anything casserole, sloppy joe sandwiches, crockbots with sweet and sour meatballs, hot biscuits and rolls. Then they started going into desserts on me, and they talked about cobblers and cookies and cakes and pecan pies and chocolate parfaits and... Me, I, deviled eggs, all right? It's the only, don't get upset with your pastor, it's the only devil thing I like, but deviled eggs are awesome, and I never get any. Let, let me just tell you, because I pray at the beginning of the meal, and I let all the family go through first, and then their guests, and then I wait to the end to go through, if there's deviled eggs, they're, they're always gone. And I got frustrated, I, I said something to one of the gals who work in our funeral ministry, and she started holding out two little deviled eggs off to the side just for me. Now, there's a woman who wants to go to heaven. It's obvious. <laughs> and so now I'm, start, I'm starting to get, I get deviled eggs now again. I'm so excited. Um, Jell-O, we don't make Jell-O at our home anymore. We don't have small kids, so we don't, I don't get Jell-O, but I get Jell-O here it, with whipped cream. Who's that, whoever is putting carrots in their Jell-O, you stop that right now. That is the cruelest joke to play on your pastor anyone can imagine. I, I bring all this up to tell you that in a way, you're going to have to give me some freedom today here in this, but in a way, the, the Last Supper of Jesus Christ is a funeral dinner in, in a small way. Jesus has his disciples with him up in the upper room. Um, this is going to be a very special, intimate time for Jesus with his followers, where he's going to take a meal that has hundreds of years of history, what's called the Passover meal, and he's going to make it about him now moving forward. And it's what you and I know as the Last Supper or as communion or the Lord's table is what it's often called. Today, I get to lead us, I get the privilege of leading us into our communion time together, and I'm looking forward to to doing that. If you're a guest with us today, uh, we're going through the Gospel of John verse by verse, and we've been in this. It's, it's an 18-month series, and people are like, you're crazy to do such a long series. It's been so good for me, for you, to just walk with Jesus and listen to Jesus and, and to go back in that time and spend that time with Jesus, and we're in the upper room now. We're only halfway through the book of John. It, it's going to take us from now till next Easter to finish up the book and we're already in the upper room. So we're just in the last week of Jesus' life. In the upper room, we're just in the last hours of Jesus' life. John, the gospel writer of John, puts that much emphasis on what happens in those last few days that we're going to spend months in it. And it's going to be so good for you and I to do that. Now, John doesn't tell us a lot about the, uh, the dinner, the meal part. In John 13, verses just 1 and 2 today, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that phrase. Who, who's there in this upper room? Don't forget, Judas is there. Who will betray him. And it says Jesus loved that man all the way to the end. The evening meal was in progress. Now that's all, that's all uh, John tells us because already he's aware that Matthew has written about this and Mark has written about this and Luke has written about this. So John doesn't spend a lot of time on, on that meal. He moves on pretty quick into the foot washing story because some of the other guys didn't tell a lot of that detail and he moves that direction. That's where we'll be next week. 
So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what happened in that mealtime that was so special? Let me go back to Luke 22 for just a few verses. Luke 22, it says, verse 15, Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, it's given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this which is poured out for you, and then it was do this in remembrance of me. This is a pretty um, amazing moment here because Jesus takes something that has been traditionally for hundreds of years, Passover, remembering the Passover. We'll come back to that in a moment. Jesus says, you know what? Now it's going to be about me. He, he, he inserts himself into this Passover meal, and he, he initiates a new covenant with his people, which we call communion time. Jesus connected himself to all of this. All right. Now, if you've not been to uh, communion time very often, uh, you're going to be surprised at how many ways there are to look at this thing because there's all these factors going on all at the same time. For people who have been in the church a long time, you've been through so many communion services, so many communion times. If you're not careful, it can become a real sleepy moment where you just eat the wafer, you drink the juice, you kind of remember, but you, your, your mind goes off in so many different directions so fast. Today, I want to take my mind and I want, to, I want to realign it again with what's important here. So there's some factors we need to be aware of. Letter A, there is that whole bread and body factor. Jesus took the bread. He said, this is his body. He breaks it. My body will be broken for you. That's all going to happen in the next 24 hours. He's going to be just beat and pummeled and punched. Hair's going to be pulled out of his beard. It's just, he's going to be just tortured in the next few hours. And this body is going to go through all of that. Why did it have to go through all of that? Because Jesus was paying a price for our sins. He was taking our punishment. When you and I go to the bread, we remember his, his body. Not to mention the whole bread factor is also connected for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. It gives life to the world. And then Jesus declared, that's me. I'm, I'm the bread. I'm that bread. The bread of life. The bread of heaven. We're, we're kind of a modern day story of what happened in uh, Israel and Egypt. What, what happened to Israel in Egypt. Israel uh, was in slavery. They were, they, were in, uh, they were captured and in slavery. And then uh, God, through the plagues, breaks them out. They spend 40 years in the wilderness, and then finally they enter the promised land. That's our story every day. We were captured by Satan. We were trapped in our sin. We were slaves to that. Jesus breaks us out of all of that. He frees us from our, from our sin. And now we live in this time in the wilderness. We live in the world we're in. We're not yet to our promised land. It's coming. It waits for those who are connected to Jesus, but we're now in this time of wilderness. While Israel was in the wilderness, God provided bread from heaven, manna. And God has once again, in Jesus Christ, provided bread for you and I while we're in our wilderness. Very interesting. Letter B is that whole um, blood and juice factor. Jesus, the, the blood of Jesus, uh, the Son purifies us from all sin. The blood, blood, blood thing. If you're new here today, you're going to be freaked out because we talk about blood, we preach about blood, we sing about blood, we pretend we're drinking blood, and if you're not comfortable with that, we sound like we're a bunch of vampires. Like, what is going on here? But in the Old Testament, blood was such an important factor. The cleansing of sin required a blood sacrifice. Why would God do that? I don't know. It, it's something that would follow all the way through history that when a real, when sin is committed, a blood sacrifice is required. So for Israel, for a long, long time, they sacrificed lambs. They, I, I don't know of many Jewish places that do it today, but they did that for a long time. Jesus' blood cleanses us from our sin too because he shed his blood 
You and I, we don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore. We just rely on his blood to cleanse us. How many places did Jesus bleed from? Well, he bled from his hands, his, his wrists when they were nailed to the cross. He bled from his feet. They were nailed to the cross. He bled from his side after Jesus died to make sure he was dead. A Roman soldier came with a long spear, and Jesus would have been elevated on a cross, and he thrust that, beer, that spear up under his ribs into his chest cavity to make sure he was dead. He bled from there. Jesus bled from his brow where that crown of thorns was pushed down on and, and the blood trickled down his face. Jesus bled from his back. Uh, the flogging that took place, the, the whips had pieces of glass and uh, bone in it so it would shred the skin on your back and 40 lashes from the back of your neck all the way to your calves. Uh, the, the meat that just hung off the back of Jesus. Does this sound too graphic? Ron shouldn't be this graphic. This is a picture of the cross. This is a picture of how Jesus bled. And when you and I drink the cup, we're supposed to remember the blood of Jesus and that he took that for us so we don't have to go through that. So when you drink the cup, this is important. This juice is important. But then, letter C, there's also the Passover factor. Oh, my gosh. It's one of my favorite pieces of communion. Okay, Passover. When, when God was trying to get his, his uh, people freed from Egypt slavery, he brought plagues, plagues on Egypt, ten of them. It would be the tenth plague that would finally break the back of Pharaoh to where he finally says, that's it, I'm done. You can You can go. Ten different plagues. That, that plague at the end, the big one, was a death angel that God sent down on Egypt. And that death angel would go house to house and door to door. And he would take the firstborn inside every home. Didn't matter if it was an adult or a child or a teen. He took the firstborn of every one of them. However, the Israelites were told before that death angel comes, if you'll sacrifice a lamb and put its blood, put the blood of the lamb on the door threshold, over the door, when the death angel gets to your home, that death angel will pass over your home and will not take your firstborn. So all the Israelites were spared that terrible pain, but Egypt was not. From that moment on, God told Israel, I want you to remember this every year. I want you to have a Passover festival every year where you bring lambs in for your sin and you shed the, the blood of a lamb to cover your sin each year. And so this became a festival that was yearly done. Here's Jesus at this Passover. And what does he say? I, I have eagerly desired to have this Passover with you. Do you know Jesus has been at Passover two other times with his disciples? He didn't say that then. But Jesus is about to be sacrificed. He's about to become the lamb for all of us. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he looked up and he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In 1 Corinthians, it says nearly the same thing. It talks about that for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Way back in Isaiah, it was prophesied that he would be led like a lamb to slaughter. You can sense how important this is. Some scholars, by the way, this was interesting new find for me. Some scholars believe that um, on the day Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem was what was traditionally, just before Passover, uh, a few days before Passover, what was known as the Lamb Selection Day. And on that day, and it, it's well documented, on that day they would bring all the sacrificial lambs that were going to be used at Passover for the people would be brought to the city. And what that means is, if they're right about this, the same day all the Passover lambs were being, were being brought into the city, Jesus, on the other side of town, came riding in triumphantly. And we always celebrate the king factor of that. But maybe it's about him being our sacrificial lamb. Maybe all the lambs came into town at the same time, including our sacrificial lamb. If that's true, boy, that will give you goosebumps. 
when you come to communion, because Jesus died for our sins, we have our own Passover lamb. We don't, we're, we're a part of a Passover celebration, but it's in a different form. The death angel passes over us. We don't have a second death. There's one other factor I want to point out. It means a lot. We don't talk a lot about it here, but D is com the community factor. When you and I come together at communion time, we suddenly become family. We become friends. Yeah. You know, in ancient times, it was wrong for, for anyone who was religious to eat a meal with sinners because eating with them implied that you were willing to connect to them. It's why Jesus is so horribly uh, criticized for eating with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus, what are you doing? You're connecting yourself to them. And Jesus said, they're the reason I came. I didn't come for healthy people. I came for those who were sick with sin. That's why I came. And so Jesus would have a meal with some of the, the darkest, most despicable people you could imagine. And now think about you and I coming to this table. We come here with all of our messes and with all of our brokenness. We come to this table. And at this table, uh, by the way, the church doesn't invite you to this table. I, I know there's churches out there. You have to be a member in order to come to communion. I, I believe Jesus invites you to this table, not us. Do, do I think it takes a level of faith, a, a level of belief that Jesus is the Son of God to come to communion? I do believe that. But I'm not inviting you to the table today. He is. And if, I'm, if as I'm talking, you're saying, you know what, I, I really feel like I need to remember Jesus and I need to take communion, then I want you to do it. But look at, look at the table in the upper room. Who's there? that Jesus shared communion with. Come on, you can see him. Judas is there, and Judas will betray him. Peter is at that table, and he'll go on to deny Jesus three times. Thomas is there, and Thomas will go on to be the great doubter in the resurrection. The rest of the disciples are just hours away from abandoning Jesus and running for their lives, leaving Jesus all alone. And in this moment, Jesus says, I love them to the end. You can hear the intimacy of this moment of communion. I have so looked forward to this moment with you. Which brings us to this morning. Jesus said, I want you to take communion in, in remembrance. And I want you to remember me. There's a little communion cup down in front of you in the pew. Just take it out, but don't open it yet. I don't... I, I'm not ready to hear any cellophane yet. Just hold on. Just take it and hold it. You're holding a memorial right here in your hand. This is a memorial. The bread and the juice is the memorial of Jesus Christ. The, the world is full of memorials. Um, some of my favorite, anything that's Martin Luther King oriented is a, a great memorial. You know that every major city out there has a Mar Martin Luther King Boulevard. There's structures and bridges named after Martin Luther King. In all these other countries, are you aware that they have memorials to Martin Luther King? It, 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 it's just incredible. In Havana, in Australia, in Kenya, Jerusalem, even in England, even in Westminster Abbey, that statue is from Westminster Abbey, they have a tribute statue there to Martin Luther King Jr. It's, it's important that we remember him. None of the structures, though, are as large uh, as the one that's in Washington, D.C. It's, it's powerful. Uh, this, this design was picked. Uh, several artists were asked to submit a, a monument design. This is the artist that won. Because he took a phrase out of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech where, where Martin Luther King says, out of a mountain of despair comes a stone of hope. Now, Martin Luther King as a minister was referring to Christ. But that, that artist used that to represent Martin Luther King. He's, he's the... Uh, stone of hope that comes out of the mountain of despair. If you look straight on at this monument, by the way, 
Martin Luther King's stone fits perfectly back in that mountain, but it's been taken out, pulled forward. Out of the mountain of despair comes a stone of hope. But also notice that Martin Luther is not completely chiseled out of the rock. There's still a lot that holds him. And that's significant. That represents that he started a bold work. He started to pull us out of something ugly as racism, but the work isn't done yet. And that's the symbolism is strong here. It's meant to be. The symbolism of this cup is strong. And it was meant to be. I've also been to the monument of uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, where Martin Luther King's remains are buried there, and it's a tomb. It's surrounded by a water moat. You, you cannot touch that memorial, but you can touch this memorial every week. Come on, be honest with me just for a moment. How many times this week did you stop everything you were doing, pulled the car off the side of the road and said, you know what, I just need to meditate for a moment on the, the death of Jesus. I need to just remember his body on that cross and his blood that was shed. It, it, like me, probably not once. I, I didn't stop and think about it. Every Sunday, this brings my mind back to it. And Jesus said, I want you to do this. Every time you do it, you, every time you eat my body, the bread, and drink the cup, my blood, you proclaim to the world my death until they come. Hey, world, we're about to proclaim to you once again that Jesus died for you. That's how much he cared. That's how much he loved you. We're about to proclaim it again. This moment, which is family for you and I, is a proclamation to the world around us. It's huge. It's so important. All right. Go ahead and take out that wafer for a moment. Just hold it. We're going to do this together. You don't have to do what I do here. But I love that Jesus broke the bread first to represent his broken body. And I, I've learned that if I just push my thumb in the middle of that wafer, it just snaps a little bit and I it's been a symbol for me if you'd like to do that you can but his broken body for me I take his body into my body let's eat together and I remember I remember the body of Jesus go ahead and open that cup it's just juice but it it's representative of something so much more. This is the blood of Jesus. It's a memorial. When Jesus made a memorial for himself, he didn't make it out of marble or stone or monument. He made it out of bread and juice. So it's important that you and I remember his blood, which was shed for us, so that we don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore. One lamb. Father, we remember your son. Let's drink together. We go through communion sometimes sleepy and just not paying attention. Every week what we do here is very important. This was the memorial of Jesus Christ. You have just been to the memorial of Jesus. And what we do here is important.